Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm here with Agent Rachel Luba again. We have another proposal to break down, and there's really not much to say because it's the same proposal, just dressed in different clothes. So there's some slight little differences, I guess, maybe. But uh, you want to explain what we got here? Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's a little um, kind of addition or change that they put into this one with the number of uh, players on the roster and the expansion of, you know, players um, or the rosters and then the taxi squads. Um, but again, that's all more or less irrelevant because yeah. the, nobody cares. I haven't heard any, right. <laughs> anything nobody, about that. I, I don't think players really yeah. um, care that much about it. It's, it's all hinging on the money. Um, and the money, once again, is... Like you said, it's the same. Um, they are offering you, again, to pay the exact same amount, more or less, um, from the previous offer, from the offer before that, and the offer before that. The difference yeah. is, is that this one, I would say, is slightly better. I mean, the last one was a worse offer than the one before. Almost. Yeah, or I've lost were... track of how many offers they've actually made and how many they've just leaked yeah. to the media. But I think there's been three official offers. Yeah, and the last, the last one, the last one. I mean, they. I think they even took some flack in the media for making a worse offer than yeah. before, um, because that doesn't really signal like you're negotiating in good faith. Um, so this one, okay, was a little better than the worst one, um, in the sense that they have now shifted or they have taken some of the risk for a postseason um, before. So the, the previous offer was, what are we at? I, there's so many numbers yeah, now getting thrown. I think it was 76, 76 game, games. Yeah. And if you, you would get basically like 50% of your prorated salary for 76 games. Now, if there's a postseason, with the postseason bonus they would give you, you can make up to, for you, it's like 71% of your prorated salary. So you guys really had to burden the risk of whether, you know, there's gonna, if there's a postseason or not, you know, you guys were the ones who took the risk. Yeah, and um, they're completely out of our control. We don't control yeah. if there's a postseason or not. Right, so uh, then for this one, what they did was now instead of just giving you 50%, um, if there's no postseason, they've offered uh, for, is it 72 games? So 70, 72 yeah. games for this one. They've offered you uh, seven, around 70% if there's no postseason. You have the ability to That's make That's 70% up. of the prorated Sorry. amount. Yeah. yeah Let's, again, we on, always I was getting crucified on Twitter earlier today. Because I said it's actually 70% guaranteed, not 80. And everyone's like, well, you're doing less than half the work. You shouldn't get 70% yeah. of the money. It's like, no, we're talking about 70% of the like per game value. It's not the total amount that we signed for, yeah. which again, comes out to be like 33%, just like- Once again, yeah, the math. All, yeah. Um, so if you play a postseason though, you can make up to about like 80%. Mm -hmm. um, like, but slightly over, I think it was like 81, or like, like basically right at 80. Uh, if yeah. there's a fully completed postseason. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you I guess there's a little less risk on the player's behalf um, in terms of what you're guaranteed. Yeah. But, I mean, you have fewer games. And you're still, again, it's all it all comes down to about 33%, um, which is what was in the previous offer, which was in the previous offer, which was in the previous offer. Yeah, so they haven't like, budged at all yeah. with the total dollars that they're willing to pay. It's just, we'll package it differently. You can yeah. play more games for us. You can play fewer. You can, you know, whatever it is. Well, this is, this is one thing that I thought was super interesting because they came out in the media and basically said what their, they, they flat out said what their worst case scenario is, which is if, Rob said, if I have to, I'll impose a was it 48 or 50 game season. 48, I think. 48 said. game season. And so now it's like you look at the money that they offered here and it's 70% guaranteed of 72 games prorated salary. And it works out to be literally the exact same as they would be paying at 48 games full prorated salary. So yeah. now we know exactly what they're doing. 
which is, okay, we're willing to do this, and we'll play more games if you want, but you guys aren't, aren't going to get any more money than what we're... Yeah, they've, they're... Which I think is why a lot of people kind of feel as though, or they're asking the question, does MLB really want to play? Like, you know, do you really want to play? Because yeah. I think it seems to me, at least, like all along, and we talked about this in one of the very first videos we did, that they just want to play the fewest number of games possible. In the regular season. Right, in the regular season. But as many as possible in the postseason because that, that's where they make their money. And, you know, we're kind of stuck, I guess, at this point where we, we don't have time. We're on the clock because every day that goes by now is every day that there is one fewer game, one less game that you can play. They could just push the postseason. They, they could just push everything back, right? Like, Yeah, like, so you would think, right? So why not push back? The, why not... Let's push it back two weeks. So we'll give ourselves two more weeks. Let's hammer this out. And then we can, you know, have two more weeks of games rather than just chop off two weeks. However, from from what we understand, the TV deals, they do not want to have postseason games. I'm sure they have other coverage going on, you know, other events, sporting events during um, other months and other weeks. I mean, after yeah, NBA is probably going to be going on then. Who, like football is coming back. Like usually comes back mid-September is when, like, college football really starts up, and then... Yeah, so they have, I mean, they plan, I mean, years in advance, right, of these TV deals. They know they know every year in October you're going to have postseason baseball, so they don't want to push that back. So for the owners to be able to get their full postseason amount, um, because I don't think they're negotiating of, oh, we'll give you prorated on, or, you know, if you push it back, it's, you know, they want their full contract that the owners were promised for these tv deals but the stipulation i think is that they cannot push back the season they've we've been told and like we've heard i guess in the media that oh well so they're worried about you know covid coming back but if you have a hard line stance to me on september 27th which i believe is the that's yeah that's the, the, date, that I've the heard. date that but I believe it's the date, the original date that the season was intended to end. Mm -hmm. um, I, I struggle to believe that you genuinely think that if we play till September 29th, there's a higher chance that that's, you yeah. have COVID, that, that we have a COVID outbreak yeah, at that point. that's not it. it to me, it's, it's purely because they want to cash in on their full TV postseason deal. And so they have to finish by that date. So you guys are just getting squished the amount that you can make um, on your prorated games so that we can ensure that during the month of October we'll have postseason baseball so the owners can get their money. Yeah, crazy. So basically, you know, knowing their bottom line is we'll, we'll pay this amount, 48 games full prorated, mm -hmm. uh, or you can play 70 games for the same amount, 72 games for the exact same amount. But every time you step on the field, you have a chance of getting injured. You have a chance of... <laughs> like taking a line drive. I got hit with a line drive, broke my shin, had to go through rehab. You have a chance of having Tommy John as a pitcher, breaking a, a hand as a, as a hitter, getting hit in the head. Mm -hmm. you know, like there's all this risk that goes along with playing. And it's, no, it's not going to be any different this year than it is every other year. But if you're saying we're only going to get X amount, but you can play 20 more games for us and we'll still pay you X amount, you're basically playing those games for free. Yep. So for players, why would you take the risk to go out there and play if you're not going to be compensated in any way and take the risk when because a lot of people on Twitter would give me this play for the love of the game deal and I get that all the players step out there and play for the love of the game I've met, I've met very very few players I have met a couple but I've met very few players that just play to get the money like that, that that's their only motivation you know there's some there are, I would say I probably can think of like two that I know for a fact they just and, and I don't blame them because, I mean, I get dedicating your life to a sport and what it can, the toll it takes. Yeah. But there are probably, I can name like two, I think, that just hate the sport mm -hmm. now, which I, I can understand. I mean, a lot of people hate their careers. And these, yeah. you, you know, you've trained your entire life like for this. So, but aside from that, it's like, I think every player feels as though like they would they play, play. They want to play. They want to be out there. They miss it. They miss competing. But you're playing while you're playing if you're playing for free it's not really for 
just like free and for entertainment for fans because the owners are sitting in their cushy little boxes making millions. Yeah. And then next year, you know, when you go out there and in one of those games, you end up getting hurt and have to rehab. And, you know, the, the owners aren't going to say, well, we really appreciate it that you played last year for free. So we're going to help mm-hmm. you out. We'll sign you to next year's contract, even though you're hurt for the same amount of money that you would have gotten if you weren't hurt. Right. You know, the fans aren't going to tell the player for sure that, hey, you know, we appreciate you going out there, taking one for the country, taking one for the team and playing and putting yourself at risk. And then, you know, we're going to compensate you in that way. So players take on all this added risk of going out there. Then also, you know, the next year's deals, uh, you know, if you don't have as many stats, if you do get hurt, like they're going to crush the market anyway. And so there's just all this financial risk off into the future by playing these extra games. Now, if you're going to be compensated how you were expecting to be compensated for those extra games, then no problem because you're going out there. There's value right now. Like right. I play these and games. And to be I... clear, again, because it seems like every time this part gets lost, you're already you're you're expecting to be compensated, or what you expect to be compensated is the prorated amount of your salary, not what you're guar- you are guaranteed. Yeah. So like, just based on games, which is right. about. You know, yeah, yeah. we're under 50%. We're now. already under 50%, right. So, exactly. yeah, and we're not asking for this. <laughs> yeah, people people get every, that. Every time. Get I'm that like, twisted. It, are you just stepping into the argument? Like. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. So, because anyway. no, that's well understood about by everybody who's been in any way following what's yeah. been going on. I wanted to jump into, the, like, negotiation tactics. Because right now, as I see it, and I'm I'm not a lawyer. I don't I don't do this for a living, but I see one side is like firmly entrenched, and the other side is firmly entrenched. And there's not really any negotiation going on in the way that I think of negotiation. Right? Negotiation is we sit down. I'm like, hey, I want this. You're like, okay, uh, well, for that, if I'm going to give you that, I would like this. I'm like, well, I can't give you that. And you say, okay, well, how about this? I'm like, well, I could do that, but I'm going to need it. You know, there's some talking. There's a back and forth. I understand what you want, you understand what I want, and we find something that like some, is somewhere in the middle, and, and then you go, that's how I think of negotiating, like we're talking about it, you know? But it doesn't seem like there's any talking necessarily going on, it's just, hey, we're gonna send over a proposal. And the other side catches and like, nope. Hey, we're gonna send over a proposal. Nope. Hey, we're gonna send over a proposal. Like, that doesn't seem like anyone's talking. So. I know we've talked a little bit before about the negotiation strategy. I think it's a really valid point that you say there's two types of negotiation strategies, dominant negotiation strategies. You want to let everybody kind of know what those two are? So, I mean, and that's one of the first things in law school that, you know, they teach. And I took, I got a certificate in dispute resolution. So it's the negotiations, the mediations and arbitrations, right? So not when you're in court or, Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of litigation. And you learn about the different, you know, negotiation strategies and when to, you know, use different tactics. And I think one of the most important parts is identifying like the situation that you're in, because that's how you decide what tactic to use. There's, you know, there's, so I guess the two tactics, the two main kinds of negotiations and I tweeted about this a little bit but I guess to explain a little more you have the first type which is the very traditional um, negotiation that people think of it's the very cutthroat one and just to be clear like there's no right or wrong I mean there's no one's not right one's not wrong they're just used in different scenarios yeah it's like a tool you go to hammer a nail you get a hammer you go to screw a screw you get a, a drill yeah so you have the first one where And this was also much more of the old school approach. Um, And it is the, when you have a one time, the way that they, I was always kind of taught it is when you're dealing with somebody and it is a one time business transaction that you're, or, you know, deal that you're trying to get done. Um, A good example, like it could be a plea deal that, you know, you're negotiating on behalf of your client who is, you know, gonna get murder charges you know, brought up for murder chart on murder charges, right? You want to, ho- hopefully you will never be having to, you know, get a deal again with these people, right? right? So I'm going to do everything in my power to set my client up in the best position so that when we walk out of there, we say that was a fucking win. Like 
Yeah. We we got the best deal. And do you know what always happens when one side feels like that? The other side yeah, loses. feels like I lost. Like, yeah, we got screwed. Ah, we, screwed. we got screwed. But, you know, it happens. Like, people have been on both sides of, of the deal. Um, a lot of, sometimes, you know, when you're buying a house, you don't, mm -hmm. hopefully, I mean, not hopefully, you might be in a situation, most people, you know, they make one purchase in their lifetime, like for a home. You want to get the best deal that you can. You don't really care necessarily if you screw over the other party because look, like, you know, if it, there's, I don't, you can't fault someone for trying to get the best deal, you know, in a one-time kind of business deal. At least I, I wouldn't. Um, so that strategy, it's a great strategy um, for specific dealings. You have then the second strategy. The second strategy is when you're dealing like ongoing business relationships with someone. A perfect example would be a union and a league, right? They're hopefully going to be having for many, many years, decades, what have you, biz a business relationship. Can't um, have one without the other in this exactly. case. Exactly. <laughs> Another example, you know, an employer, um, you know, a company and an employee. Um, and again, I tweeted about this and I can go, I'm going to go into it a little more in a second, but there was with Barstool recently, I know a lot of people um, followed the caller daddy drama um, and I'll go into that in a second. But so when you have a situation where you are you, ha you are trying to negotiate with another party who you plan and anticipate to have a long ongoing relationship with, the last thing you want to do is if you come out of that negotiation thinking, dude, we just scored. Like they, that was the worst deal for them. What were they thinking? They're not gonna be happy. And then you don't have a great relationship. This happens a lot of, I mean, you see it play out sometimes with teams and even just a, a player, right? Mm. And I'm not saying, and now as an agent, like that there aren't players you wanna go in and get the best damn deal you can for that player because you know, hope maybe that's the only time you're ever going to negotiate. He's got one long contract, right? Get as much as you can. Fine. But, you know, like you don't want the buyer or, you know, the your employer to feel like they got a shitty deal. Right. But this is also true. And like you may not have just one client. Like, yeah, you go in and you negotiate with Team X and you take them for all they're worth and you treat them really bad and you get the best deal for your client. Well, the next time you have a client, like, they're not going to want to deal with you, you know. They're, they're, right, so it creates some ill to, will on both sides. Like, but I would not... never. I would never. Say, there is that, but at the same time, like then you have a conflict of interest with it, another client, and so that's a whole another topic to go into. And sure, that that happens. Where, so yeah, you have to balance all of these things. But if you have an ongoing relationship with someone, right? You want them. You want to come out of the negotiation and both parties feeling like we got a good deal. It was a win-win. And there's the, so there's the win-loss strategy and there's the win-win strategy. They're both great. They both should be used at different times. You should be able to use both tactics. The worst thing you can be as a negotiator is to only know how to use one tactic because you will not be the most effective negotiator in the end if, yeah. if that's how you operate. And so then, you know, there's the art of and I don't think it's that difficult, but figuring out, look, what situation am I in and what kind of tactic do I need to use? Do I want to, you know, stand firm on this and play chicken and I'm, you know, stare down the barrel of the gun and like, I, this is what I want? Or do I not want, do I want to have some sort of relationship where now we can be productive together mm -hmm. because we both are happy. We both don't feel like the other party screwed me. That's the worst thing. You're screwed as, you're screwed in terms of having a working relationship, yeah. if the other party continually feels like you screwed me, because yeah. you know what they're going to do the next time you walk into a negotiation, they're going to try to get back at you a little, and then mm -hmm. they're going to try to screw you, and then you're going to feel screwed, and then you just sit there now, and it kind of seems like this when with what's going on right now is like each party is trying to, each party feels like they were not treated fairly, mm -hmm. and so each party wants to, you know exact their revenge and get yeah. get even be made whole and it's it sucks because there's other people that end up like the fans that now have to pay the price because of 
you know, a relationship that's not so great. And uh, like I said, I was going to, you know, talk about the collar daddy, the bar stool thing. Mm -hmm. It was a perfect, like the nerd in me got so excited when I saw it. And I, I think I was telling you about it because not that I cared about the drama of any of it, but I, when I, st I went down a rabbit hole watching, like listening to Portnoy talk about it and both Sophia and Alex talk about from their sides and what happened because I was fascinated in terms of the negotiation of it. And you saw two parties. You, you rarely have like two parties who are their own individual person and have their own interests, but yet are on the, you know, same side kind of negotiating mm -hmm. together. And to see it that clearly play out where one takes the strategy, the first strategy of I'm going to milk you for everything that I can. Like I'm going to suck everything I can out of this. I want, I want to come out feeling on top. And then the other party is like, look, like I want to work together. I, I want, how do, how do we get a win-win here? Because Alex, in this case, she saw the benefit of what Barstool provides for her. She liked the relationship. Like she wanted an ongoing and a continued relationship. And then you have Sophia's strategy where, she, you know, trying to get the win-loss strategy. And you see in the beginning, it worked at first when they talk about how the negotiations went because all of a sudden Alex is like, whoa, like you're getting way more than we even asked for. And she's like, you know, almost like uncomfortable, like we weren't even asking for that. But Sophia's getting more and more and asking for more and more. But then she got to the point where you, you risk it and you push it. And now she literally, I mean, she, she severed the relationship. Like she ruined it because then... Dave's at the point, he's like, you know what? Screw, screw you. Uh, we don't need you here. Mm -hmm. So you're out. Like, you're done. And now Sophia does not work for Barstool anymore. She is not on the podcast anymore. It is just Alex. And again, to me, I mean, if I'm negotiating, I would have taken Alex's strategy all along because you want, if you're going to try to keep working with them, you don't want to put them in that situation where they feel like, Fuck well, you. It, it, to, to me, it's a it's a short term versus long term thing, right? Mm -hmm. If it's short term, then you take the strategy. I want everything I can get right now. Right. If it's long term, you're looking at it like, okay, well, I could be working here. I could have this podcast for twenty years, thirty years. Like, look at the the wealth that I can build. Look at the relationship we can have. Look at all the things we can do together. And this just seems very MLB to me on both yeah. sides. It's like MLB has traditionally been very short sighted. What do we do right now? Like, how do we make money right now? And like, what's good for right now? And they right. don't, they lack it the vision. It doesn't have to be even a, it doesn't have to be a 30, 40, 50 years, but it could be a two year thing. Sure. Do I have to have a working relationship? Like you're not, go I mean, an employee employer is also very different because it, it's a lot shorter in term, but this is an ongoing, you know, for long past when you and I have been in baseball, when probably we'll continue to be in baseball, this will continue. So right. you want to have a working relationship. Right. And yeah, trying so, to screw someone over now, trying to screw the players, the union over now, isn't going to set you up well for then when the next CBA comes around. Yeah. So how do you fix this? Because that's ultimately like we're in this situation and this dispute right now is going to get resolved and ultimately... You know, baseball will go on this year at some in some capacity. Baseball will happen next year, and then you're going to have the CBA. And the worst possible thing for baseball is if this we play 50 games this year, and then we have a lockout or a strike after next season. So how do you get how, how do you get two sides that seem to be so entrenched in like not talking and, and just like strategy was the strategy one where it's like the win lose strategy. How do you get two sides to them? There's so much How distrust. You, There's yeah, so yeah. Much. How do you peel back the layers of the onion to get them to come together? And what does that even look like when you're using strategy two? Is it like they sit down and they have lunch and they just literally just try to have a relationship? It's and it's not really talk business. Or how do you how do you do that? It's really hard because a, a lot of times the problem is when this happens all the time where you get into a relationship like this where you would the second strategy would be much more beneficial, but it's not being used and what inevitably happens every time is that it just the the business relationship crumbles and that's mm -hmm. it and it does it's at, it's done just like you saw with barstool it's over yeah. they don't have any the hostile environment anymore because sophia's gone yeah 
The problem is, is that this is a very, you know, one of the more unique situations where it can't really just fizzle out. And that's why we've just seen it perpetuate yeah. of just this hostile environment. And I don't know, like they need their own dispute resolution, to, you know, yeah. within their own negotiations because I don't know. Do you sit, well, you seems, sit them both down and tell them, you know, like talk about your feelings and how you feel like yeah, you've been Yeah, do we need to take MLB and MLBPA <laughs> to a counselor? Sometimes, <laughs> like, sometimes I feel you need the teacher get a marriage to counselor. come in. Or, <laughs> yeah, why do you feel like this, you know, they've broken your trust and what? But I don't know. It, you need, you need parties on both sides that can have a working relationship. Well, as a lawyer, you're negotiating with someone, right? And you don't trust them, but you have to negotiate with them. Is there a strategy that you use to like, because you can't very well just have one side say, you know what? We're stuck in position one. We're going to go with strategy two. And now we're going to be open. We're going to have a dialogue. We're going to you know, share with them and be and want this working relationship. Because if, this, if the other side hasn't decided that, then you're just opening yourself up to, to lose big time, right? Is that? I think you can keep your barriers up and your guard up without um, making yourself super vulnerable necessarily, but you can get creative with, you know, the different, then, I mean, this is, this is the, that's the most difficult situation is when you have to negotiate with someone that you don't trust, but you then have to put yourself in their head, in their mind, and you have to start getting creative and you can't then just like, use the same tactics that you've used in other situations. It, you have to, you know, employ a tactic that is very unique and specific to this situation. And how do I creatively, you know, get what I want? And sometimes it's, look, I'm not going to give you anything necessarily of value to me, but if you make it seem like, look, I, I actually really want to work with you, they're going to be kind of thrown off like, you know, they, they're not, usually they're not naive to the fact that there's a lack of trust there. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, kind of extend an olive branch and, you know, look, I want to try to work with you without giving up anything necessarily valuable, sometimes that goes a long way too. Yeah, it seems, I mean, we were talking a while back about your time at the PA and MLB's offices are right there. They're two blocks you know, walk, and, you walk down the street to that. And you'd think, yeah, you'd think that there'd be intermingling, you know, you're close is, by, yeah. it, like how much of that actually goes on in a, in that capacity. I know like during arbitration, you, the, 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 the PA literally walks, uh, the, the offers and the, the filing, numbers. the filing numbers over to MLB's office and they sit down and they have this ritual where you, you try to guess the number, right. And you exchange and, and stuff like that. So that seems like something where it's, at least a, a working relationship and that mm -hmm. specific part of it. You know, how much is, how much are Rob and Tony talking? How, or how much are the lawyers like sitting down and like in the same room and talking? Did that ever happen? Do you know like? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a working, re there is a relationship there for sure. Um, you know, there are meetings that the union goes over, the lawyers go over to MLB's office. They walk down the street, uh, you know, go to their office, have meetings. MLBs, their lawyers will come to the union. Same thing. There's, we don't see them, I guess, sitting down and um, talking right now. And a lot of that was because of COVID-19. They physically couldn't be there. So that didn't help probably to start it off because everything was just kind of done, um, you know, over email. But there's, just because you're in the same room as, as somebody doesn't mean that it's necessarily a, That's true. a a great working relationship. And there's just there's a lack of I think trust on on both on all, both sides. I saw of a it. tweet. I saw a tweet today that said that you know players feel like they've been bullied by the owners. And so um, one of the things actually that I learned this or I heard about this in uh, domestic violence training that we go through every spring training and what part of one of the presentations was you know power in a relationship and if one party feels like the other party has more power than them it's an unequal relationship and that's how you know the domestic violence starts the parent has more power than the kid right the husband has more power than the wife the whatever the the situation might, might be 
So if the players are feeling bullied by the owners, then it seems like the power is residing with the ownership or with MLB, and the players feel like they're getting bullied, and it's, in a way, this kind of abusive relationship. I don't want to term it like that because it's not it's not the You're, best example right. by any means. But just looking at the power differences, like if players don't feel like they have the power and MLB does feel like they have the power, there's this unequal relationship. So right. it seems like they need to unwind that. A lot of it seems to be centering around the financial, like the financials of the league, because there's no transparency with what the league makes on. Uh, in the postseason, the, the actual language in the TV contracts, what the actual gate revenue is uh, during season, how much would actually be lost if playing with no fans, what are the, you know, all the, the, the restaurants and the little ballpark uh, amenities that surround the ballparks that are owned by the owners, what do those bring in that are, you know, I so... Think, I think another big thing, too, that, I mean, would help, and again, this kind of is something... A tactic that you learn in negotiation is sitting sit down with the other party and figure out like there's always something when anytime you want to have a business relationship with someone you have something in common that's why that's why you're having yeah. you're having a negotiation with them you have things in common figure those out because then you know you can work together at least to achieve those things and a lot of times the other things kind of align or you know somewhat align I think you know, a scenario where, I don't know, obviously this would not, I mean, you can't, it'd be so hard to get it to happen, but if owners sat down with players and like, look, this is what we want for the sport. This is what we want for our teams. Showing, look, we care. We want to see it grow. My guess is players, you know, would say, this is what we want to see for our sport too. We want to see it grow. We want to see that. I think we're forgetting that both sides want the same thing. Players want owners to make money you know why because it will directly it should directly correlate in then what owners are willing to spend on players and their compensation and if they feel like look we're going to help you guys make money we're going to promote the game we're going to do more what can we do and then they see you know look now owners are going out and spending and now if you have a free agent you know an, uh, an off-season market where there's no n- no one spending and players are like What's going on? Yeah. That, that's and that, where, that seems and to that's be the disconnect started. right now, right? Mm-hmm. Because you would assume that if the industry makes more money, then owners make more money, then owners have more money to spend and players would make more money. And so that would be good for everybody. But what we see is revenues continue to rise, team valuations continue to rise, and then the player share stays relatively the same or sometimes shrinks. This was one of the first years last year where I believe the average salary dropped for the first time ever I think. right now you have the the top end that's making these massive deals you sure. know you saw rendon cole um trout like yeah. harper you always then you have also that, have but the middle class is what's shrinking uh, yeah right and you've already heard owners talking about next year how they're only going to have players on minimums or the free agents that they have to pay and so they're just getting rid of all the you know the, the middle class. class and so now the the players feel like they're being you know that, that trust has been broken because look you know, the industry is making more money, but why aren't we seeing the money, right? And so then that's where the, the initial distrust came in. And it's so just that, that, perpetuated. That's, right. And then there's all sorts of other things that get stacked on top of that. And that's how we ended up in this situation. So I think it's imperative that we find some way to have transparency on both sides of like, look, this is what we want. This is the direction we see it going. Okay, this is the direction you see it going. And like, those are actually pretty similar. So we can, we can work yeah. that out. One of the questions I had uh, during this whole process was like, specifically relating, relating to the CBA, since this is kind of like a mini CBA discussion because we're trying to come up with the rules on the fly and figure it out because of COVID-19. Well, it's not really but, similar in that sense. It's all on the fly and only really pertaining to this year. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's at least there's a negotiation back and forth about when, how things are going to start. So it's like a, a sneak peek into what... You know, the, hopefully not. Hopefully but not, yeah. right? But is there a scenario where you just like completely like ditched the tactic that you've been using or the, like all sorts of uh, your history and just do something completely new? For instance, I'm thinking, would you just propose a drastically different like CBA? Is there any situation where like the union may perhaps just write out like this is exactly how we would like to see it in a perfect world for us? and submit that over to MLB and then see if there's 
like if they could talk about it would that like disrupt the flow of this bad trust between each other enough that it might shift the relationship in some way sure of course like th that could happen but you're also this is coming from one of the ultimate like disruptors in the industry of from your side you love doing that you love taking something that's just always been done this way and it has whatever you know uh, like wh however people view it it is what it is and you love to come in and do something completely different i did it too with my with athlete representation yeah it will shake things up it gets people talking it gets people who are doing it the same way all the time talking about does this make sense but how often do you have a disruptor in anything. It, it, yeah, but it just also see like uh, the way I see it, I don't disrupt just to disrupt. I, I, mean, I look at things. Sure. I, I see inefficiencies, glaring inefficiencies. But, but and this I'm like, isn't this, any different. This could be solved so much easier. Of course, but this isn't any different. There's right. a glaring inefficiency. This could be solved. Like maybe here's a way to let's just change our tactic. Yeah, it would work, but I think the vast majority of people are not comfortable with doing that. And so, but yeah. yeah, sure, that's a tact. There, there are definitely tactics you can use that I think would help. If I think we have to reevaluate everything about how we're dealing with all of this stuff. Yeah, the, because it's the relationship. Mainly, the relationship is, yeah. because we're hurt, we we're hurting the, the sport and we're we're hurting the fans and the fans are what make the sport. Without the fans, we don't have anything. Yeah. So we have to figure out a way. And we, ha we can't be selfish anymore. We can't be selfish about, you know, we're, we want this for us and the other side, well, we want this and only this for us. Like, how do we make this grow? Because at the end of the day, if we, if we can't, then we lose the fans and then we lose the right. sport. Well, I think the fans realize that it's broken right now. Like, yeah. Because they, they feel, you know, they're, they're getting they a lot of They right? feel betrayed. They feel, yeah, and the their players, sport. I think the players feel like the industry for a couple of years now, if not more than that, has been broken and there's some serious things that need to be changed because of the thing you see the this middle class disappearing and average salaries falling and that betrayal of trust. I don't think the the league office sees that it's broken because I don't think the owner yeah the they're owners they're making more yeah. money because they have these TV contracts, national TV and local TV and they're signed and the industry is making more money and the, you know things are going well but they're running straight to a cliff. Right, know? because but the TV deals the TV deals too they all they're all up at different points, and they all there aren't they aren't just for a year. They're for m multiple yeah, years. Some of them are thirty year TV deals. Yeah, so it, it's one thing to see. Okay, yeah, it keeps escalating, keeps going up each year, but at some point there's going to be a TV deal or a team that is up to renegotiate, and the TV deals aren't going to be there. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is I think it's going to take until that moment happens. So we could have, if their TV deal's 30 years, I mean, they could have go 30 more years thinking this is great. We don't have yeah. to do anything. They're not looking, and again, There's like just, invisible damage that you're doing to the sport yeah. that's masked and this, by the TV deal. Right, this goes back towards the whole, to the whole point of everything's so short-sighted sometimes. Mm -hmm. You're not, you have to look out into the future and see like, how is this going to compound and end up hurting us or helping us in the end? And I think the NBA is a great example of someone who's adopted a fan, a fan friendly, growth minded strategy. And you look at the NBA is booming. I mean, over the next five to 10 years, the NBA is going to be the most dominant, watched, most interesting. What about UFC? Sport. UFC's done a great job too, investing in storytelling on the fighters. Uh, you know, the, the, it's a little bit different in the fight industry because it's all very promotional right. and you can, there's this drama that you can build up between two guys. And that was a conversation I was having earlier today as well. Is like, there used to be drama in baseball because players would stay with an individual team for a long time. So you had, you know, Yankees, Red Sox, but the players were the same for seven or eight years before free agency really like started shifting around the way it is. Dodgers, Giants, you know, you have these rivalries, right? And then the fans could understand a little bit about the personality of the player just by watching them play their favorite team so much. And so that you'd have the heel and you'd have your favorite. And if, if, pro wrestling has taught us anything it's the storyline of good versus evil right it doesn't matter if they're actually good or evil or if it's real or not it's yeah. just the storytelling behind it and UFC does a great job of that because it's a one-on-one -on -one thing you have this dude and that dude right and they hate each other for all these reasons and they fight and then 
some of it was fake and some of it was not and whatever, right? But it creates interest. Yeah. Now with baseball, you know, players move around so much uh, that you don't ever, and you don't get the story of the player yeah. to really understand him because they don't have an invested in narrative. And so it's just But, so, but the NBA, it's the same thing. It's happened to the NBA that you used to have players stay with the team. And it was, I mean, even in the Jordan doc we saw, you kind of got a peek into what it was like, you know, even, you know, several years ago right. where, but, but the way that they capitalized on the changing markets where they started investing in the storytelling of players themselves mm -hmm. people and we talk about this a lot but people were fans of the heat when lebron was there then they became fans of the Cavs when lebron was there and now they're fans of the lakers because they're fans of lebron mm -hmm. and that's what if baseball i think i mean my opinion is if baseball wants to grow they need to start promoting the individual athletes because then fans will be drawn towards the athletes and they will follow them no matter where they go and then they will watch those games they will right. watch those teams and that's not a that's not a short-term strategy it's not a short-term money grab because you're going to end up spending a little yeah. bit of money and you're not going to see immediate return mm -hmm. and so in the first couple of years it might look like a bad decision but over the course of the first five ten when you start cycling some of these young players that you really tried to tell a story on and promote and work with and they become the next versions of you know Francisco Lindor, Mike Trout, Rendon, Scherzer, right. like these these superstars and the fan they have a huge fan following and the fans know them and their personality then you're going to start seeing massive amounts of growth and it just doesn't fit with the strategy that they've that yeah. MLB's been using which is all about how do we make money now and how do we make money tomorrow but yeah. we'll figure out next year when we get there but anyway uh last thing before we go your prediction how many games do we end up playing this year give me a number i don't know 55 55 i gotta sit like 62 at this point that's about where i'm at so we'll see I moved, I moved a little bit off of my original number of 60. I think there's going to be 62 now. So we'll see how close we get. But uh, that's all for today. That's the new proposal. That's really just the same proposal. And some of the reasons why we're in this situation, the distrust between the league and the union, a couple of the reasons why that exists. Who's winning and who's losing? Fans are losing. Players are losing and owners are losing. Everyone's losing right now. Uh, I need to work together and figure out how it can be a win-win-win fans, owners, and players. So both sides have a lot of work to do. And the fans, well, all the players want to be out there playing and entertaining you guys. So hopefully we get to do that soon. See you guys in the next one.